Thank you for uh, the nice introduction. Uh, it's good to be back to the school. I was here in the early 80s as guidance counselor for the grade school and as a club teacher for fourth year high school. So, in effect, hindi na bago na nandito ako sa, sa inyo. Last, uh, two years ago, I was also uh, a speaker in terms of uh, Capuchin Pedagogy, which I spearheaded for 20 years. So, now, my topic would be about the Capuchins yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's really a, a, something that is close to my heart as a former Capuchin and still involved in many of the Capuchin works. Okay, so the title is The Capuchins Yesterday, Today, and in the Future. Okay, next slide, please. So before we, we go into the Capuchins per se, let us examine first the background of the Capuchins and see how it has traveled from Europe to the Philippines. So the first thing that you will remember is the Capuchins is founded by St. Francis and that's the reality. So when we go back to history, the reform happened in the 16th century. It's about 300 years after the death of St. Francis. So it was a reform movement in 1525. So about 300 years after the death of St. Francis. So what were the characteristics of this reform movement? Number one, there is a stricter observance of the rule of St. Francis. Uh, one of the reasons why the reform was made was that they, there was a, a feeling that there was laxity in the order. So the group of friars led by Mateo de Basio uh, moved for a stricter observance of the rule of St. Francis. Secondly, they, they wanted to emphasize the contemplative dimension of Franciscan life. Okay, so the first friars, the first Capuchins live in hermitages in huts. Okay, so more on the prayer life. So there is a stricter following of the rule to the letter, as said in your introduction, then the contemplative dimension. Thirdly, we also have extreme austerity simplicity and poverty. Actually, that's within the, the rule of St. Francis. So austerity, simplicity, and poverty. So the Capuchins, if you, if you would go back into history, they were very famous, uh, number one, during the Black Plague. You, if you go back into history in Europe, there was there was the Black Plague. So they were especially known for their preaching and missionary work, which were two aspects of their ministerial charism. So, so one of these, uh, they, were, they were famous, they were noted when they worked during the bubonic plague or the Black Plague, in which about 2,000 friars died. With this plague. So it's not very unfamiliar because of the, of the pandemic that we have today. So it was, it was basically just the same. So it was the Black Plague. It was born by uh, rats and fleas. So many people died and the Capuchins were there in the forefront caring for the sick people afflicted by the plague. So Pope Pius the 11th would say, for example, that the Capuchins were Marines of the church. Okay, so Pius the 11th. Pope Pius the 11th would say, uh, they are like Marines. So they would go 
wherever there was no one to do something. Okay? Uh, there was no one to do the thing that was needed to be done. So, sila yung leaders there. Okay? So, they will call uh, Marines of the church. So, this is the general background of the Capuchins. Uh, you know, they were austere. They were a breakaway group from the original observance, which is now the OFM. The Franciscan which was uh, related to you yesterday. So the Capuchins was a breakaway group. It's a reform movement of that Franciscan group. So we, you, you are perhaps aware that we have three branches in the, uh, in the Franciscan, in the first order. The observants, the Capuchins, and the conventuals. Okay, so next slide, please. So let's now go back, go to, to the history of the Capuchins in the Philippines. Okay. So it was in the later part of the 18th century. When, when the, the governments of Spain and the Philippines requested that friars will be sent to the Far East. Why? One of the reasons, if you go into history, this was the time of Bismarck, von Bismarck. If you go back to history, there was a so-called German expansion efforts in the Far East. So in order na hindi makuha ng Germans in the Far East, the, prior, uh, the, the Spanish government requested the friars, uh, the, the religious congregations, to send missionaries to the Far East. So that was the, in response to this, was the first expedition, which was directed for Marianas and Palaos or Palau Islands. So that's in, in, in the Far East. Now, if you go to the map, there is a map there. You see that uh, Palau and the Marianas are in the eastern part of the Philippines. Okay, it's the east. So on May 13, 1886, aboard Isla de Panay, oh, this is the ship that they rode, they arrived in the Philippines. Okay, but it was only a stopover in the Philippines. The intention was really to go to the Marianas and the Palau Islands or the Palau Islands. Okay, so, so what happened here? Now, who were the... So I, I, there is a, a yellow and uh, there is a blue marking there. So the, if, if you look at it, nasa eastern side siya. So near Guam, you can see Guam, then Micronesia, Papua New Guinea, West Papua, there is Palau, and the Northern Mariana Islands. Okay, so this was the intention. The intention was really to go to these islands. Now, so if we, if we look at the, the, the composition of the group, in, in 1886, May 13, 1886, it was composed of actually six lay brothers and six priests. So if you, if you try to analyze that man, the, the lay brothers were at a, a, a common ground with the priests. Okay? So there were... There were six lay brothers and six priests. So, okay, these are examples of the Capuchins which came to the Philippines. Although they were not the first group because there were only 12. If you look at that, uh, those pictures, there were more than 12. So there were 12 who came, although one died during the journey. So one died during the journey. So. After arriving in the Philippines and staying with the Franciscans, okay, the six, six of those who came to the Philippines proceeded to Marianas and Palaos. And there were five which remained in the Philippines. So there were five. Okay. 
So six missionaries continued their journey to the Palaos, to the Carolines, and the five remained in the Philippines and was given the charge of ministering to the spiritual needs of the natives in Gagalangin and Tondo. Okay, so next slide, please. So the first mission territory was really Gagalangin in the Philippines. It was really Gagalangin and Tondo. It started in 1886 until 1905. So by the way, uh, as, I, as a side note, the Philippines was established as a procura house for the missions in the Carolines, in the Marianas and the Palaos Islands. So a procura house is really a, a house in which provisions are made, are, are gathered to be sent to the missionary territories. So this is yung, uh, by the term itself to procure, they get the materials needed so that they can be sent to the missionary territories. So that's the, the note. So the first mission territory in the Philippines was really in Gagalangin and Tondo, which was 1886 to 1905. And it consists really of the celebration of the sacraments, sick calls, answering sick calls, and catechism for children. Okay, so where did, next slide please. So they live, they live, first of all, they, they did not live long in the, with the Franciscans. Okay, so they rented a small Nipa touched house. Okay. Uh, that that house was in San Marcelino Street. Uh, so you you this is now familiar. These are familiar things. Then they moved to Moralia, um, San Marcelino. Then Moralia. This is now in Intramuros. Then to San Rafael Street. Then to Solana Street, and then finally settled in General Luna Street. Although I think General Luna Street at the time was not General Luna Street. Okay, this is a new name. Although if you if you are at Intramuros and you are facing the cathedral, the, the Manila Cathedral, it is on the right side. It's the right road. Okay, so that's General Luna. So at the back of the Manila Cathedral would be the, the first Capuchin house. Okay, they also built a small chapel there, which they dedicated to Mary. Okay, which is the, 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 the mother of the Divine Shepherd or Divina Pastora. Okay, so they dedicated that to Divina Pastora. Why Divina Pastora? If you ask me the question. Divina Pastora or the divine, uh, the, the lady, uh, this is Mary. Uh, divina Pastora or the mother of the divine shepherd was a special patron, the, the patroness of the Capuchin, the Spanish Capuchin missions in the Philippines. So that's the reason why it was dedicated to Mary, the Divina Pastora. So this was dedicated in May 8, 1892. Now, there was also at that church a small statue of Our Lady of Lourdes. Okay. So, yung, yung, yung imahe, meron sa isang sulok, there was an image of Our Lady of Lourdes. Okay. So, and it was observed that there were more devotees to Our Lady of Lourdes than to Divina Pastora. Okay? That was the reason why in September 15, 1893, okay, uh, they erected uh, a confraternity of Our Lady of Lourdes was established. The confraternity of Our Lady of Lourdes was established in September 15, 1893. It was attached to the Arch Confraternity in Lourdes, France. 
So it was only a confraternity in September 1893. However, in 1910, Pope Pius X elevated it to an arts confraternity, and therefore all confraternities in the Philippines are to be attached to the confraternity of Our Lady of Luz. Okay, so this is day two. You can find now in the Church of uh, Our Lady of Luz in Piro. Okay, so this is not this is not uh, strange anymore to you, okay? Because you have you you pass by it daily, nakikita nyo, so you 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 see that, okay? So after that, in eighteen, so the church was was built in eighteen ninety nine. And it was dedicated now to Our Lady of Cruz because there were more devotees to Our Lady of Cruz. So that was the beginning, 1899. And it was destroyed in 1945. So if you, if you try to look at history, 1945 was the bombardment of Manila by the Japanese. So it was raised to the ground. Uh, you can still find the ruins, uh, honestly, I have been there in Intramuros and you can still find the ruins in what is now the Silahis Arts and Crafts in General Luna or the Illustrado restaurant. So the grounds of the Illustrado is occupied now by Illustrado and Silahis Arts and Crafts in Intramuros. So you can go there and see the ruins, uh, pwede naman din doon magpa-prenup. Okay, so you can find that the, 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 the church in, uh, in Intramuros. So in 18, 1896, now there was a royal decree. If you look at it, before 1896, 1886 to 1893 years, the opposites were really not recognized as missionaries in the Philippines. Para sila mga squatter, okay, squatter Filipinas. So there was a royal decree which arrived in 1896, which established the Capuchins as missionaries with equal status as other five recognized missionary congregations in the Philippines, namely the Augustinians, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Jesuits, and the Recollects. Now, if you look at this in, in history, this was also the time when most of the missionaries were going back to Spain. They were leaving the Philippines because of the political situation. Okay, so there was a growing, the, the revolution was growing at this time. So most of the congregations left the Philippines in 1886 when they were, the Capuchins were coming in. So that was the, the, that is the story. That's the footnote, a historical footnote into that uh, situation of the Capuchins. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this was the image. If you look at it, this was the image of Our Lady of Lourdes being celebrated on in the feast day of Our Lady of Lourdes, and it was celebrated with a procession. So that's in intramuros. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, so this is the interior of the old Our Lady of Lourdes Church in Intramuros. So this is the interior. Ito yung nasa loob. Ito yung makikita mo sa loob. This was a picture of the interior of the Church of Our Lady of Lourdes in Intramuros. Okay, next slide, please. And this was the facade of the church, okay? Looking from the outside, this was the facade of the church in Intramuros, Our Lady of Lourdes Church. And on the side, on the right side, you will find a marker which states that it was the site of the old Lourdes Church in Intramuros. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the first uh, five missionaries which stayed in the Philippines, okay, 
began to grow in number because in 1901, more missionaries now were sent to the Philippines. Now, these missionaries now were really intended for the Philippines. It was not anymore intended for the Carolines, Marianas and Palaos Islands, but they were more intended to the Philippines. So, okay, so they were assigned, first of all, to the Diocese of Manila. It was still a diocese. Uh, it was even Bulacan. Okay, so the Diocese of Manila. So they served in the churches of Ermita. So that's 1903 to 1957. Then in Singalong, that's in San Andres, 1905 to 1997, and in Santa Mesa, 1911 to 1911. So uh, there were also assignments in San Juan de Bolbuc in Batangas in 1904, in Sariaya, Quezon, 1905. Bigaa, which is now Balagtas, Bulacan, in 1905, and Tabaco Albay, 1905. So if you look at this map, this was the expansion already in 1905. So most of the dates here are 1905. Now in the eastern part, they were assigned at Tanay and Kivilia. Okay? So Tanay. If you look at the picture, the, the upper picture is the Church of Tanay. Okay, and the lower picture is the church in Ermita. Okay, now you will find out that in the facade of this, in this church of these churches, you will find the logo of the Franciscans, the, the crisscross arms. Okay, so you have to look for it. No, makikita nyo sa mga churches na ito, yung logo in the facade of the churches. So, Tanay, Pililia, Tamako, Biga, Sariaya, etc. etc. So, uh, again, as a footnote, they were noted also as preachers. So the people want I uh, one of the bishops wanted them to come along when he was visiting other places because they were asked to be preachers. Okay, so this is 1901, but if you look at the, uh, the assignments, it's already 1905. Now. You are familiar with Singalong and Santa Mesa and Ermita, Tanay and Kevilio. Okay, so next slide, please. So this is again the uh, church in Tanay. Okay. Uh, incidentally, we had visited that church when we had a spiritual formation at the School of Mandaluya. And uh, we visited the churches of Tanay, Pilia, Baras, etc. in the eastern part of uh, the eastern part of Metro Manila. Next slide, please. Okay, now, so owing, for example, uh, to to more numbers that were coming to the Philippines as missionaries, we, we, but we must remember that they also met opposition. Number one, they were Spaniards, and the Spaniards were we were already under the American rule, so whenever ever they met, merong pagtingin na they, they were Spaniards and they were enemies at some point. Okay, so but uh, that was not a reason for giving up. So in 1929, okay, they thought of expanding now from the other uh, from from Metro Manila to the south. They, they decided to expand to the north, okay? So in the north, they started with San Miguel Tabla, which is now, if you look at it, there is no church there now. Uh, there is given no sign of, there was a church in San Miguel Tabla at the site indicated, okay? But if you, if you we, we also tried to look at it, it's located somewhere in Hacienda Luisita, okay? So that's the church there, but there are no ruins now anymore of the church in San Miguel Tabla. Now, we have, okay, Aguilar, Bugalion, Labrador, Salasa, and Suwal. These are all in Pangasinan. These are western towns in the province of Pangasinan. So if you, for example, travel going to, for example, uh, in Masadulo, Bulinao, for example, you will pass by this 
Township, Adelaide, Bugalion, Labrador, Salasa, Sugar. Salasa is in Bugalion, actually. So, next slide, please. So, by the way, the uh, okay, balik do sa previous slide. If you if you try to look at it at the back at the background, that is the church in Salasa. And the, the church is Our Lady of Lourdes Church in Salasa. So the name of the church is Our Lady of Lourdes Salasa in Bugalion. Okay, so I also had a a a chance to visit the place during our spiritual formation. So the towns of Aguilar, Bugalion, Labrador, Salasa, Suwal, these are all towns in the province of Pangasinan. Okay, next slide, please. Now, after, after being in the north, now they decided, after some time, they decided that uh, it's quite difficult to go to the north, number one, uh, Aguilar, Bugalion, Salasa, Labrador, Suwal. These are Pangasinense speaking people. Okay, they, they are not Ilocano speaking people. They are Pangasinense speaking people. So it was quite difficult. Although I, I uh, there was a grammar book that was written by Father Julian, which I met personally. And I saw the book that he, he it was a grammar book in Pangasinense. So that's how they, 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 they work with, the, with the, the natives. So in sometime after 1929, you see 1929 was the, the, area, the time when they went to, to the north. Now, after some time, they had difficulty with Pangasinense and people were not trained specifically in the language. So they, they, they said, let us now concentrate in the Tagalog speaking areas. Okay, so instead of the northern Pangasinense uh, speaking areas, they decided to go into missionary work with Tagalog speaking areas. So in 1939, they established, for example, the house in Tagaytay, Our Lady of Lourdes in Tagaytay. And in 1942, they started Santa Teresita. Uh, you, you are familiar with that. Okay, it's in uh, Mayon Street. Okay, so 1942, Quezon City, 1942. Now in Retiro or in, in currently NSA Morantes, 1952. In Mandaluyo, 1958. In Tagkawayan, San Narciso, San Andres, in Quezon, 1959. Lipa in 1966. And Pulu, Pabuyao, Laguna in 1970. 1970. So these are now from the Tagalog. Uh, actually, if you look at this list, Tagaytay remains, Santa Teresita remains, Retiro remains, Mandaluyong remains, Lipa and Pulo remains. Okay? Uh, they are not anymore in Tagkawayan, San Narciso, or in San Andres. So, but the others, they are still present. Okay, at the same time, they started the school ministry. So, for example, in Singalo, which is a parochial school, for those who are familiar with this, with Ikasaam, for example, you remember the, the competition between the four Franciscan schools. Our uh, St. Anthony School, Singalo, 1936. Then Sacred Heart Parochial School, this is in Old Santa Mesa, is in 1947. Okay, the church remains there. Then LSQC is established 1954 and LSM at 19, in 1959. So as a footnote, LSQC was established really as a seedbed for vocations. Uh, it, it was the original purpose. It was really to plant the seeds of four vocations in the Philippines. So that was the reason why they put up LSQC. So anybody who would want to go into religious life 
should go back to this group uh, reason why LSQC was uh, established. Okay, next slide, please. So these are now the current. Uh, now, if you go back to history, most of the friars who went to the Philippines were from the province of Catalonia in Spain. Okay, so we have Valencia, for example. It comes from the province of Catalonia. But there was a new circumscription which happened in which everybody had to go back to their places of origin. So the friars here in the Philippines went back to Catalonia. And Catalonia was, was unable to send more people, into, more friars into the Philippines, into their mission territories. And it was turned over to, to the province of Navarra, Cantabria, Aragon. Okay, so you remember these three names, Navarra, Cantabria, Aragon. This is a province in, the, in, the, in Spain. Okay, we took charge of the Philippine mission. Okay, which became a custody in 1957. So the Philippines became a custody in 1957, then became a vice province in 1970, and a full province in April 23, 1985, during the Feast of Three Fidelis of Sigma So if you look at the, the history, that is why most of the, the Spanish friars come from the province of Navarra uh, recently come from the province of Navarra, Cantabria, and Aragon. Okay, because this was the, the province which was in charge of the Philippines. Okay, so the, the province was dedicated to Our Lady of Cruz, which was the patron saint, the patron, patroness of the order in the Philippines. Okay, next slide. So after, after uh, actually this is an arbitrary division. So I, I divided it into three parts. The first part would be until the, the, the mission from 1886 until 1985, which was the time when the Philippines became a full Filipino province. So let us now go to the present. What is the present? Okay, so at present, there are 11 fraternities. Okay, we call that a fraternity. It's not convents. We do not call them convents. We call them fraternities. It's the brotherhood that, that exists in convents. So there, and there are 11 fraternities, five of which are in matrimony. If you look at it, as I said, we still retain Fitiro, Santa Teresita, Santa Mesa, Singalong, Mandaluyan. Uh, when it was constituted as a province, established as a province, we had these five fraternities in Metro Manila. There were two fraternities in Tagaytay. One is in the eastern side, which is in Sungai, and the other is our Lady of Lewis in Tagaytay City, Sungai. We have one in Pulo, Kabuyao, okay, uh, is that the retained. Then we have Lipa, which is the, the present day minor seminary. We have Baguio, okay, this is on Pakdal Road, and in Davila Kasukin, Ilocos Norte, which is the Hermitage, okay? So there were 11 fraternities when it was constituted as a province, okay? Of these 11 fraternities, there were 69 professed brothers, okay? Of which 10 came from Spain, and some of you, I guess, know them. Okay, Father Manuel, Apo, for example, were, were here when uh, it was a province. Now, there were also established seminaries. For example, Our Lady of Luz Seminary in Lipa was established in 1967, and it's just celebrated its 50 years of existence in, in 2017. Now, we have Baguio City. Then Tagaytay City, which was built in 1957, it is now a theology house of the province. Okay, former day the theologians were sent abroad to study because we did not have yet the seminaries to build. Okay, but the growing number of those who are interested to pursue the religious life in the capital 
okay, allow them to prioritize the, the building of seminars. Okay, next slide. So after after that, more came. Okay, more came. So we have already Baluan in General Santos City, then Davao City. Then we had a presence, we have a par parish, we, yeah, the capacities have a parish uh, in General Mariano Alvarez, this is in Cavite. And the youngest is actually Titay, this is now in Cabuanga, Sibugay. Okay, so these are now a three from the south, a three from Mindanao, and one in Luzon, so from General Mariano Alvarez or DMA. So, this were, this, these are the fraternities added to the 11 uh, that was said. Although we, in the later part of the 20th century, Singalong and Santa Mesa were turned over back to the Archdiocese of Manila. So, naging nine na lang, plus four, we have 13 fraternities for the north. Although, there were fraternities, there are newer fraternities established, for example, there's a fraternity currently now staying at CRC, the Capuchin Renewal Center in the city. And there is a fraternity, again, another fraternity in Lipa, which is the infirmary fraternity. Okay, so they, this recent addition to the, to the fraternities that are now constituted under the club. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so if you, if you, as I analyze the, the situation of the Capuchins present, actually this is a personal uh, observation. These are their present day ministers. Okay, number one, okay, are the schools. Okay, we are familiar with that. LSUC and LSF continue to exist as present day ministers. Okay, then we have parishes. We have, uh, for example, Alberio Flores, or Santa Teresita, or Mandaluyo, or Cabuya, uh, or Laguna. These are parishes, or uh, GMA. These are parishes uh, ministered by the Catholics. Okay. But there is a, something special. The number three is there is what they call an evangelical witness of presence. Okay. Basically, we find this in now. Uh, for example, in uh, General Santo City and Davao City, there is the evangelical witness of presence. What, what do you mean by this now? They're just present in, in, among the people, living with them, okay, sharing whatever they have. Okay? They're not, they not in charge of houses or schools or, or whatever, but they are just they are witnessing to the life of Christ and St. Francis in the very place where they are. So this is now happening in Mindanao. Now, number four is retreat and renewal. So if you go back, one of the characteristics of the Catholic Church is the contemplative life. So it's not, it's not unusual that we have a retreat house out in the Pacific, okay, that's the CRC, and a renewal house which we find in Davila. Okay, it's actually a hermitage. He said, if you want to go into a deep prayer, you go to Dagen. So, then, number five is missions. Okay, missions. Uh, the Kapazis is, is a missionary order. So, one of their charism is always mission. So, uh, in my experience, one of the first missions they had was in Papua New Guinea, okay? This is the Micronesia. Uh, we have seen the map before. So it's, it's just below the Philippines. Currently, they are now in the Middle East, okay? In particularly in, in the Emirates, okay? In Qatar, in Saudi Arabia, in Oman, etc. So in the Middle East. So these are mission territories. And this is, uh, the Capuchins are ministering to overseas Filipino workers in these territories. So, they're, 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 
they serve the the Filipinos in those places in the Middle East. So number six, spiritual guidance. Okay. So you must be familiar with the Clarissa's Capuchinas. Okay. This already have a number of contents. Okay. In the Philippines. So they they are they serve as spiritual guide, uh, guides to the second order. This is the Capuchinas, which is uh, St. Clair, the Footlers. And also the third order. I was, I was once assigned as a spiritual assistant for the Diocese of Imos, assistant, assistant to the spiritual director. Okay. Then also we have the youth. Okay. You are familiar with Franciscan youth movement or youthfora. Okay. So you, these are organizations of the youth of the Franciscan. Okay. Uh, this is also the syndicate of the church, of I, I told. Then they were, uh, they are involved with the neo catechumenal community in some parish organizations as spiritual guides. Okay. So, uh, this, this was the work that they did. The number seven, we have Chaplain C. I was, uh, you, you will try to see there is military hospitals. Okay. Uh, my classmate, Father Edward, was once a military chaplain. Okay. Uh, and I know someone who was also a chaplain in a hospital, particularly in QI. You know QI, Quezon Institute. Okay. You know, chaplain to them. Wala na ngayon yung QI. Okay. And then, National Orthopedic. Hospital. Okay. Number eight, which is still ongoing, is social work. Now, uh, in, in 1991, okay, the Kasama Foundation was established actually to answer to the earthquake. If you were familiar with the earthquake in 1990, uh, then the following year, 1991, it was followed by the eruption of uh, in a tubo. So because of that, the foundation was started by Father Nelson. And I was part of that foundation. We were we had a project in Florida Blanca catering to those who were affected by Mount Pinatub. Okay. At present we have Tulay Lingap. Okay, Tulay Lingap, which is a a medical facility. You can find this one in uh, in Mandaluyong under the church, our lady of uh, St. Francis of Assisi Church in Mandaluyo, that's the Tulayulina. Okay, now you are familiar, currently you are familiar with Taal, how the Capuchins responded by providing shelter to those who were displaced by the eruption in Taal. Then you might be familiar with the Raitan, also in Palayan City, okay? So these are works with natives, for example, okay, uh, providing them relief assistance and medical works. Then you are also familiar with the pandemic-related works. For example, we have Kaadapa, which is a donation drive, really for the people who were affected by the pandemic, okay. So. You must be familiar with the community pantries, uh, the distribution of food around the parish, uh, assistance to jeepney drivers, etc. Okay, and the, the it was also done with uh, the PDO, the the philanthropic development. Okay. okay, and the last lastly number nine, we have ecological works. Okay, so if if you look at the the the, the condition of, of the capuchins, okay, they have at the end of the value systems that they had, we have justice, peace, and ecology. Okay, care for nature. So it's just given a special emphasis with with the with the Laudato Si. So at present. 
There are projects, for example, like Capuchin 511. What is Capuchin 511? Okay, there was a, uh, this was narrated to me by Father Egai. He said that there is, the, each specific fraternity are two plant, five trees, maintain one herbal garden and one vegetable garden. So that's five trees, one herbal garden, and one uh, vegetable garden. Okay, so that's Capuchin 511. Also in, in support of the, the 500 years of, the, of, of uh, Christianity in the Philippines, there were, they are something 500 trees in Bugalion, Lagit Parilla in Bugalion. Okay, so 500 trees as support also for, for, for uh, uh, the, the for Christianity in the Philippines and also for ecology. So these are the ministries. If I have forgotten something, it might be included in, in any of those categories. Okay. So next slide, please. Okay, so these are these are pictures here. Okay, uh, if you look at the pictures, uh, the one upper right is the the one in the Raita, I suppose. Then the next picture there is the Ministry to the Second Order, the Clarissas. The third picture on the right. Up upper right is the chapel in Davao, okay, which is evangelical person. Then the lower right, okay, the lower right, that's the church, that's a, San Isidro Labrador in Itay, Sabuanda. Then these are really populations happening currently. And the last one is the, the distribution of food stock. Okay, these are these are the works that they currently do. Okay, so it's not just a fraternity among men, it's the, it's the universal brotherhood that is supposed to happen. Okay, they minister to everybody in need or where there is work for them. No, no work is really too small to be done. Okay, so whatever it is there are, the captains are there. So I used, for example, will tell them would say that they were the the church. Okay, so next slide, please. So currently, okay, currently, oh, by the way, uh, we, I would like to ask for your prayers because right now, the Capuchins have a special chapter happening in Lipa right now, okay? Today, happening, we started even last Monday, so, I'm asking for your prayers for them. So currently, there are 65 perpetually professed brothers. Okay? Perpetually professed. There are 42 now in formation. And there are on, at present 11 fraternities, which include CRC in Lipa and the infirmary also in Lipa. So there are 11 fraternities, 42. Brothers in formation that's from Lipa until today, and perpetually professed 65. So, this is the current statistics. I, I asked that from the Office of Information at Santa Teresita at Baja Cappuccino, and they gave me the, the number. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so we have finished with the present. Actually, uh, this. This is more in the present is more familiar with you what, what is happening in the, in, the, in the present. Now, the future, now actually I ask a few of the friars of their ideas regarding what the future holds for them. So uh, based on their answers, I, I grouped them into three. Number one is expansion or growth in terms of numbers. So, they are still asking for more vocations, more to enter the religious life with the Catholics, more to share the life of the brothers. Okay, so they are they are looking forward to expansion in growth in terms of numbers. Secondly, there is also an expansion in terms of the new forms of apostolate. We never know what will happen today, 
the next day. Okay. So, but we we are assured that as Marines, they will be where they need to be. So there will be new forms of apostolate. We do not know what this forms of apostolate may be. Okay, but they will be there. Okay, so there will be expansion and growth in terms of new apostolate. Okay, by the way, they are looking now into the possibility of a presence in the Visayas. If you look at if you look at their uh, presence of, of present, they are concentrated in Luzon and now. They do not have the presence in the Visayas. So they are looking now at, at Panay Island and Cebu, perhaps, as uh, houses of presence, for example, in the Visayas. So number three is now missions. It's a continuation, really, of the current missions that they have. And one important mission that they are eyeing is the mission in China. Okay, uh, you must be aware that it was a lifelong team of uh, Father Mateo to go to, to be a missionary to China. Okay, so they are not uh, giving up on this dream and they want to expand into the mission. So the Philippines now, as a missionary territory before, is now becoming a missionary hub. If you look at the present, the realities you you will see that Philipp, uh, the Philippines is sending missionaries to the to the Middle East. So in the future, it will also become a missionary hub, but it will be dependent in terms of numbers, of course. Number one, and uh, where they will be needed in the future. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, on a final note, okay. So we, we ask the question will the capitalism continue to be relevant in the future? Okay, I was asking that question. So will they be relevant? Will not will they be will they fold up? Okay, in the Philippines. So this was the answer that came to me. Actually, the future is dependent, number one, on their awareness of their own identity and charisma. It's not a copying somebody else. Okay? They have their own identity given by their charisma. Okay? Contemplative prayer, austerity, poverty, etc. Okay? So it will be dependent on the awareness of this identity and charisma, missionary work. Well, Okay, service to others. Okay, and they can do this number one by continuing formation is to form the brothers by developing habits of prayer. Okay, so this is in the contemplative aspect. Then faithfulness to sound tradition. Okay, uh, the traditions that happen in the history of the Catholics in, in the whole world. Okay, and the continuing spiritual and corporal service to the poor, to the needy, to those who have nobody else in their life. So I think uh, the Capricans will continue to be relevant when they decide for themselves that they are still uh, rooted in the same traditions as the Capricans, as the Franciscans, in same countries, and ultimately to Jesus Christ, who is the Savior. And as said, for example, if the Lord does not build the house, in vain in its laborers' labor. Okay, so part of the part of the future is really dependent also on, on God Himself. Okay, we must remember that this is not done merely on human efforts, but it's a combination of what we do. With the grace of God. So how we work on the grace of God, that's the, the, the reason for our continuation to the future. Okay, so with that, I, I finish my talk. Okay, thank you. And access morning to everyone today. Now, we would, we would now entertain questions from our audience. 
to moderate our open forum, I would like to turn the virtual floor over to Mr. Brian B. De La Pena. Thank you, Jean. It's now 10.33 in the morning, and so far, there are already some of us who have questions uh, for our speaker, Mr. Dennis Nakwa. But before that, we would like to acknowledge the presence of USC History Associate Professor and our speaker yesterday, Dr. Maria Eloisa de Castro. She is joining us today. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, we are happy that uh, you're here with us again uh, this Wednesday. Now to our questions. Uh, we have one uh, from uh, one of our organizers, uh, Sir Ed Chico. He is our uh, faculty member here at uh, LSPC Senior High School. Ms. Uh, Sir Dennis, he would like to know if, uh, 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 sorry, I I'm reading the message uh, or the question. He says that we know that little has been written by researchers and historians about the Capuchins in the Philippines. So with that, what are some points, sir, in the history of the Capuchin Philippine province that you know, could be expounded further by researchers and historians? Kasi nga po parang yun nga, medyo kulang sa records or kulang sa, sa data. San po pwedeng pumasok ang mga researchers natin, ang mga historians natin? Okay, so uh, if, if you look at history, one of the things which I am also interested in is what happened to the Capuchins during the revolution itself. Okay, uh, the revolution happened in 1898. So where were the Capuchins at that time? It seems that history was silent or historical records are silent about the experience of the Capuchins during the revolution. There were records regarding the, the Japanese uh, atrocities in Manila about the Capuchins. There were nine who were murdered uh, in the Philippines during the, uh, the, during the, the Japanese occupation. But we have no records on what happened to the Capuchins during the revolution. Let us remember, they were here when the, the Philippine Revolution started. And when the Americans came, they were already here. So what has happened? Because if we try to look at it, uh, actually, uh, this is based only on a, a book, uh, the, the archives, in the archives, which, which narrates all of these things in, the, in, uh, in Spanish, and it was translated. So this is the only book that we use uh, to go back to the history. Now, the second thing we must remember is Franciscans usually do not write. Okay? St. Francis never wrote. <laughs> Di ba? Hindi siya, hindi mahilig na nagsusulat ng mga, they wrote after the fact. Okay? So, after the fact. It's not, it's not planning, etc. Doing paperwork before anything else. So, they write only after the fact. So, uh, it involves more of the exper experience of the, the people who under, underwent the experience. Okay, so these are the two things. Uh, these are the, the th this is something that we have to, to think about. Because they were not really, they were not here to write, <laughs> number one. That, that's the, the, the reality. And so if we want to go further, we can examine records again. Regarding the Philippine Revolution, we must remember that during this time, most of the missionaries went back to Spain because they were afraid of the revolution. So, but there were five Capuchins in the Philippines at that time until 1901. So, what was their experience during the revolution? They were in Intramuros. We, we, we know that because there was the church in Intramuros, or Lado Cruz in Intramuros. And the missions started only in the north and east of Manila. That's already after the 1900s. Okay. Okay. So, May 1898 is a significant date. So, as a historian, perhaps you could look into these records. You know, if, if Meron talagang records, but if records are extant, then we cannot do anything about it. You know? All right. Uh, okay. So that, that's quite an interesting uh, insight that uh, I have just learned today that, you know, Medjo, uh, it's not really 
should I say, sir, that it's not in the priority of uh, Franciscans to write or to to record um, what they do, no? Parang, parang it's not, they're more on really rendering service. Yeah. No? Sir? Tama, no? Yeah, yeah. Kasi if, if you try to look it, uh, if you try to record it, sikat ka eh, di ba? You will be the, ikaw, ikaw yung karakter eh. But mm. that's not the purpose, really. Because mm. what you are trying to do is really the work of God. So therefore, you, you, if, if you look at the Testament of Francis, for example, if you analyze it, Francis said, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Yun lagi niya sinasabi. Okay? Hindi niya sinasabi, ako, 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 ako. No. Uh, it's the Lord who does things to him. Okay, gave me brothers, okay, led me to the poor, led me to lepers, etc. So, this is the action of the Lord. So, siguro, may intindihan natin ang, ang, ang historia ng Capuchins based on this. Uh, although, we might have eyewitness accounts that can give us records also of history. But uh, writing for themselves is some sort of self-aggrandizement. Siguro, you know? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. I think uh, uh, maganda ko yung pagkakapaliwanag ninyo, no, Sir Dennis, no, na hindi sila nagsulat dahil hindi nila aim na sumikat. So it's again, it's a story of humility, a story of, you know, uh, giving uh, praise to whom talaga, kung kanino talaga nararapat ang papuri. And of course, we know that, you know, like what you said, it's always the Lord. But, Okay, now to us, uh, we go back to the discussion on the archives, on the records, because uh, some members of the audience are really interested no, uh, about this topic. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Sir Ed. What are the records about the Capuchins Philippine province that are currently stored in the archives? Uh, there is an archive, I think, in my Capuchino, in uh, Apostate. Okay, so... I'm not sure, so sure what are the, the, the real historical records. Maybe because what we have in the book is already a compilation of the, some of the written works that were made by previous Capuchins. So I, I would ask them if they would be interested to visit my Cappuccino and look for, for uh, the archives, uh, whatever historical records are there. So they, they can make researches on particular things they are interested in. All right. So I guess that uh, thank you, sir, for answering. No? Uh, so again, uh, the Thomas, uh, sir, no, the provincial archives is located at the Bahay Capuchino on Apo Street in Quezon City. Yes. 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 Tama yes. Po, no? So I guess that answers the question of our Jean uh, Clasara, but. Uh, Arjun has another question. How can the researchers or how can you know uh, people who are interested in the topic access the records? Because we know that uh, priests also live in there. Okay, so they can make a, a particular request. It's not, it's not difficult. Hindi naman mahirap kausap na ang kutsino. Actually, you can ask them anything. Uh, it would be part of their service to, to, to open whatever they have, records, for example. Of their, uh, of their past to whoever is interested, no? Hindi naman ipangalanda ka nyo, no? Meron kami record dito, gusto nyo, etc. So you have to just ask permission, okay? And I, I, I suppose they would be all too willing to open up their uh, the archives for those who are interested. Okay po, ayan. So mga, sa mga gustong pumunta sa, uh, sa Bahay Capuchino to find out more about uh, uh, the history of Capuchins, Franciscan Capuchins, you are uh, most welcome. So ibig sabihin po, sir, yung question din ni James Benedict Malabanan about uh, whether there are any records about the image of uh, the La Virgen Divina Pastora in Intramuros. Nandun din po ba yun? Yes. Uh, yung sa, sa image ni Divina Pastora, I, I suppose so. No? Uh, but it was an original image that was brought by the Capuchins from Spain because Divina Pastora, if you remember, was the patroness of the Spanish 
cappuccino missions. So you you go back because Divina Pastora was was uh, started by some ano bang pangalan nun? Uh, I wrote it down here. The one who started. Brother Isidore of Sevilla. So, most of the records, for example, you have to go to Spain, particularly at the Navarra, Cantabria, Aragon province. They also have an archive there. Or the Catalonia province also, because this is where everything started in the first place. Okay, so original sources may be present in those places. And then, sir, conf uh, maybe confirm kung kailan po, uh, also from James uh, Benedict Malabanan, kung kailan po ang devotion uh, kay uh, Divina Pastora. Uh, medyo iba-iba po lumalabas sa, iba-iba po lumalabas sa Google, may January 14. Uh, so I believe sa, sa Espanya kung saan, I'm sure nakakaroon ng, uh, ng uh, procession doon, attracting millions of pilgrims, sabi nga rito. But maybe confirm that, sir? If it's on January 14? Uh, well, I, I'm not so sure about that because uh, actually, na, napalitan na kasi siya dito. When, when I was already in the seminary, we were already with, with Luz. Okay, so mm -hmm. we are more familiar with Luz than with Divina Pastora. But we can find an image of Divina Pastora in the church in Sungai. Okay, so, but I'm not so sure of the feast, uh, the feast day. We can consult the order for that. Uh, this is the official church calendar for the feast day of the saints. No, hindi uh, naman tayo mag-rely lang sa internet. We have to rely on official church records on when this is really celebrated. Because there are, there, uh, as you said, there are many different dates that are attributed to the celebration. But the church has an official day for celebrating the celebration. Okay. All right. So, uh, so to James, I'm sorry for that. No. Uh, so to James, uh, thank you for that question. He is from Pintacasi PH. We're glad to have our uh, uh, audience members from Pintacasi uh, PH here or Pintacasi Philippines here in this talk. We have a question from John Brian Cavalli. I think he was also uh, active in our open forum yesterday. So I'm guessing, sir, you unang tanong niya about uh, available resources about the missionary and catechetical work. I'm sure it's in the it's in our archives at Sabahe Capuchino, no, sir? No? Yes, 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 yes. Opo. Uh, he, he also is asking, uh, considering that the Capuchins arrived fairly recent uh, here in the Philippines, or perhaps compared to other uh, orders, how did they initially propagate the devotion of Our Lady of Lourdes? To the natives during the early years of Capuchin presence, uh, you know, parang again, na, nando naman po yun ano, mahanap naman po yun doon lahat. Nakadetalye yes, po yes, siya yes. sa archives. Eh, and then, according to the narrative, uh, the Our Lady of Rose was a statue which was placed some, somewhere in the church, okay, which was dedicated primarily to Divina Pastora. So, alam mo naman sa simbahan, May mga lugar dyan, nilalagyan nila ng mga santo. Okay? So, one of the, one statue there was the statue of Our Lady of Luz. And it was observed na mas marami ang namimituho kay Our Lady of Luz rather than Divina Pastora. That was the reason why there was a change of mind and dedicate the church and the province uh, later on to Our Lady of Rose, even seminaries, even churches now, you, you see there are early, several Our Lady of Rose churches in the Philippines. Okay? Mas popular kasi ang Lourdes, kahit na sa atin, di ba? Popular. Popular. Hanggang ngayon, popular ang Our Lady of Rose. You, you can see grottos, for example, in private homes, but you do not see open Divina Pastora. Okay? So, mas na-propagate yung yung Our Lady of Lourdes, no? which was more popular. And number one, maybe because yung, yung, yung power ng healing, because of the healing powers of Our Lady of Lourdes. Okay? 
Uh, Pag-healer naman kasi, for example, uh, a present, marami pumunta kay Padre Pio sa Matangas, for example. Why? It's more of healing. It's the healing part that we are asking for from the Lord. Okay? So, so yun yung, yun yung ano, uh, mas popular yung mga paring healer. Di ba? Kasi yung mga nagsisermon lang. Di ba? So, this is a part of a psychology. A, psychological frame of mind that uh, healers are more popular than than other other forms of uh, charism. Yeah, so talaga ang daming uh, interesado. So again, sa mga uh, gustong uh, manaliksik for those who want to uh, know more about our history, uh, the history of our Capuchin brothers, uh, don't hesitate to visit Bahay Capuchino on Apple Street. Uh, in Quezon City, if I'm not mistaken, the provincial minister is Father Edgar Martinez of the Capuchin Order Friars Minor. Please don't be afraid to say hi to him. I, I am sure he will be happy to, uh, you know, to, to answer your questions. Now from history, now we go to the social dimension you know, of the Capuchins. I'm sure they had a lot of that. Um, uh, and until now, you no, know, their, their social uh, presence is being felt. But we have a question now from uh, our assistant principal for academic affairs in the senior high school department, Mr. Marvin Depano. Hi, Sir Marvin. His question is: In what ways, or or to what extent, can the social presence of the Capitans be felt? Lalo na po, Sir, when they voice out their stance or when they initiate any form of action on social issues, political issues, just as other religious orders do. How do, okay. do we see that both? To what extent, sir? Uh, uh, so we are in a time of, of, of a political situation here, pressure. So if you ask me honestly, okay, one, one of my criticism of the Capuchins was they did not have any specific stance. Okay, I remember during the time of the revolution, the Philippine Revolution, there was a sign in front of LSM. May nakasulat doon. LSM, walang pakialam. Okay? Walang pakialam. Siya nangyayari. Siya nangyayari sa mundo. Okay? So, okay. Yeah. so if you try to analyze this, Okay, it is a, a voice of a human being saying, accompany me in the journey. Okay, but if you try to look at the, the, the Franciscan as a, an order, if you go back to the life of Francis, he never criticized anybody. Na nag yung mayor at saka yung bishop, hindi naman niya kinampihan yung mayor o yung bishop. Okay, he made them friends. Okay. So if you try to look at history, uh, there were not so much, uh, the Capuchins, for example, are not so much into social issues, not like other Franciscans. I know the Franciscans who are in the forefront. Uh, SFIC is also in the forefront of uh, the uh, political stance, of a political stance, okay? Now, you're saying Joseph, you know, Madre Saint Joseph, or even you know, Madre sa Cobao, no? Stella Maris, for example. Okay, so if you if you try to look at the this situation, ano nang parang parang sa sabi mo walang pakialam, okay? They they don't care about what's happening in the world, but personally they have their own preferences, but they rather not tell it to everybody and shout about it or there will be some who will be more bold enough to tell about their own particular stance. But that does not change the basic, the basic charism, which is fraternity. No? Magkaiba man tayo ng isipan, magkaiba man tayo ng kapatid I think that's the more important thing. How can we preserve, kasi divisive ang politika eh. It's, it's really divisive. Uh, it divides people, di ba? In politika. It, it goes against the, the, the charism of fraternity that we are one, we are creatures of God. Okay? And so, in terms of the spirituality, I think that's the answer of the Capuchins regarding the political situation. 
Okay, they might have personal uh, views on particular political matters, but as a whole, it, each one has his own conscience to, to, to follow. And I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the Carlism of a Franciscan, which is, is more important for us to be brothers rather than to be enemies of each other. So, ito yung, ito yung, ano, ito yung pinaka base, base. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, although, uh, sige, sir, pero, uh, I was supposed to ask a follow-up question, but uh, Sir Marvin uh, al uh, already has a follow-up question. But what about the concept, daw po, sir, of fraternal correction? Is that, or is it something uh, that is unique to Capuchins? Uh, how should we contextualize this fraternal correction? Fraternal correction. If you, it's, it's not, it's not really, it's not really a concept that is peculiar to to Franciscans or Catholics. Because if you if you go into the gospel, there is fraternal correction when Jesus says, "If someone has something against you, you find another one, etc., etc." Tell him to his to, to his ano yung kasalanan niya, etc., etc. So there was already the concept of fraternal correction even in the time of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was really uh, corrected everybody who had uh, ano. But if you, if you uh, I think I think it's, it's also a duty to tell somebody that he is doing something that is not not uh, good or uh, is against. I know, but with charity, to accept him with charity also at the same time. Hindi lang basta pagalitan mo, okay? Correction is not simply as to, to tell him you're wrong, then shun him away. But another correction is, on, is telling him what, is, what he has done, but at the same time, accepting him as a brother. So that's... That's, that's another that's a dimension to fraternal correction. Kasi ang, ang gusto kasi natin, pagsabihan lang. Okay? Awayin. Pagsabihan, etc. But that is not the whole of fraternal correction. Fraternal correction also is acceptance of the other as a brother. No? In need of mercy. Uh, remember, uh, this is, the, the Franciscan looks at Jesus on the cross. And if you look at Jesus on the cross, it was Jesus, the merciful God. Okay? So, union dapat. No? Sometimes we, we will have to say things. But at the same time, accept him as a brother. And there is, there is no... Hindi tayo hihin po dun sa, ano lang, sa pagagalitan ng natin. Okay? We will have to do something else. To win him over, no? Kasi kung pagagalitan mo, more divisions will come about, right? But if you you show to him that he's a brother, he's in need of God himself, then magti change yung yung buong ano situation. Okay. So, sir, uh, yeah. Answer that. Yeah. Uh, Sir, so I push. I'll just have to go back to that point, Kanina, on uh, you know, on, on the stance, stance of uh, of of Capuchins when it comes to political issues. Uh, hindi po ba? Kasi sabi niya po na parang medyo they hindi parang masyadong should we say forward? Hindi masyadong not as vocal, vocal relatively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No? yeah um, vocal. Sir. Sir, hindi ho ba, hindi ba, hindi ho ba, halimbawa, sasa, baka sabihin ng mga tao na parang, okay, so you're serving people, but you're not, you're not voicing your, um, your political stance. Uh, parang hindi po ba, par, hindi po ba siya parang may disconnect? Because I'm also asking this based on the fact that the church did play a major role you know, in some of the major political events in our country. We know this, uh, it's a uh, first people power revolution. Uh, it was Jaime Cardinal Sin, uh, pop, uh, a very prominent figure in the Catholic Church in the country who, you know, um, who, who led you know, uh, uh, 
a peaceful revolution that ousted the dictator. Uh, we, this is some, and this is just one of uh, the other, you know, uh, political events where the church had a role. So, your thoughts, sir, on that? Okay, so if, if, if you are asking me as a whole, as an order, for example, in the Philippines, they do not have a particular political stance. No, uh, they don't support a particular person uh, because we, as I, again, as I said. It is left to individual consciences to decide on whoever they want. But as a as a group, as, as a province, for example, they do not say, oh, we are for this candidate or that kind of candidate. Okay? So we have to understand that. There is a respect for, for the dignity of the human being. No, hindi naman pag sinabi ng pinuno, susunod lahat. Ibig sabihin, pag galit ka sa isang tao, galit na lahat. No, that's, not, that's not the point there. The point is, as a group, they do not have, but individually, they will have, and they will speak out. Okay, I have known some of the brothers who speak out against uh, uh, a political person, for example. Okay, so, wala na bang masama. Wala na bang masama. Okay, and secondly, I would like to emphasize that. The best thing to do, for example, is not is not two words. Okay, you not go about arguing who is the best. Okay, you show it in your in the way you act. So important yung witness, yung witnessing, you witness to justice, you witness to peace, you witness to equality, etc. You witness to faith, you witness to Jesus Christ. That is all. Huh? Hindi mo na kailangan magsalita. You remember there was a, a, an anecdote in the life of Francis that the brother asked him, pumunta sila sa isang lugar, the brother asked him, wala ka naman sinabi ah. Sabi ni Francis, nakapag-sermon na tayo, uwi na tayo. Okay? They have seen us. Okay, so the life itself is a witness to what you... Ano. Kasi ang gusto natin, is is human na kailan post post uh, say 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 no. no there is we have to balance it with witnessing kasi baka puro tayo sa dita wala na namang gawa so mas importante yung pinapakita natin yung ating value systems uh, we we are a counter culture what we are saying is what people are doing is wrong by the way we live our lives no it's not it's not blaming them, not telling them. Because that is uncharitable, number one. Hindi na yan charity. Ang charity is really to accept him as a brother. So, I know we are delving into spirituality, capacity spirituality here. No? The Franciscan spirituality. Which is important because, for example, when I discussed, for example, a few years back regarding pedagogy, it came na ang ating, ang ating particular educational model is really as a brother. No? We teach as a brother. No? Hindi, hindi yan yung dichotomous na student teacher. Everybody is a brother. Everybody is learning from everybody. So that's how I, I think uh, personal, personal ko na naman yan, ha? observation regarding regarding the events, you no? Know? Although sometimes I would say, But then, I, I would further reflect that siguro mayroon silang ibang gustong ipahihwating sa ginagawa nila. And we have to find out what that is. And I think that's paternity. That's minority. Di ba? Ang servant ba? Can you say against something against the master? No. Diba? Sunod na nga na sunod. Ito sa Erbant. Diba? Sa Erbant. No? But there are also leadership qualities uh, that are present. But we, we lead by doing. Okay? We lead by doing. So, yun. <laughs> we live yeah, by I, doing. Yeah, Believing witnesses. Yeah. 
very beautiful conclusion there, sir. Maraming salamat po, Mr. Dennis Nakwa, for joining us. We truly appreciate your time with us.